Hi, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Professor Heather Brook. I run the investigative MA program at City University of London. And welcome uh, to this first, well, one of the first sessions at Perugia. Um, really glad to see you here. So we've got a panel of uh, two teachers and two students, former students who are now professionals. Um, and so we're gonna give a bit of a variety of thoughts about um, investigative journalism and how to teach it. Um, obviously, it's a bit of a rhetorical question, can investigative journalism be taught? Because as a teacher, I'm obviously going to say yes. <laughs> um, but what I'm, yeah, what I think what, what, what I'm going to say is that some things can be taught, other things can't. But what, we, what I'm going to focus on are the things that can be taught and how you teach them. So I'm going to um, briefly introduce the panel. Then um, we're each going to do about uh, a few minutes sort of overview of, of our, of what we're gonna, a few remarks. And then um, I might ask a couple of questions of the panel and then I'll, I'll give you lots of opportunity to ask your own questions afterwards. So, um, thanks. Um, so yeah, I've introduced myself uh, and I might say a few more things afterwards, but uh, over there is Anya Schifrin who has a very long title, which she's just given me, which is, um, but basically she teaches at Columbia University. Um, and she, her official title is Director of the Technology, Media and Advocacy Specialization in the School of International and Public Affairs. But she'll talk more, they do a really, when I was, I taught at Columbia as well a few years ago, but they do a really interesting program of one year doing international affairs and one year doing um, in the journalism school. So, so she'll talk about that. Um, James Ball here, a former intern of mine, um, made good, um, won a Pulitzer Prize um, for the Snowden Inquiry, uh, Snowden Investigation, and worked at the Bureau of Investigative Journalism and The Guardian and BuzzFeed, and is now um, also teaching with me on the MA Investigative Journalism course at City, and writing books and doing all manner of other things. Um, Alice Ross, next to him, also a student at City on the investigative course, and went on to the Bureau of Investigative Journalism and The Guardian and now works as an investigative reporter at Unearthed News, which is the investigative unit that was set up at Greenpeace to do environmental investigations. So um, I'll start and I'll talk a little bit about how we teach investigative journalism at City University. So I've taught at the university for about 13 years, but I've been running the course for two years. And one of the first things I, I, so I'll say about can you teach it or not teach it, is that when I do the application selection for students who want to, people that want to apply to be students, I'm looking for certain qualities, I would say kind of personality qualities of things I think make good investigative journalists. And that is um, a real kind, and, and these are things which I would say can't be taught. So it's a, it's a real obsessive desire for truth, to get to the bottom of things, and tenacity, uh, that, that, that they don't give up easily. I like to see some evidence that these are kind of, kind of obstinate people who, who aren't put off by a bit of uh, rejection or obstruction. Because if you're doing inv any kind of decent investigation, there are no press releases sent out you know, uh, about what you're looking into. And in fact, all efforts are made to stop you finding out what it is that, that you want to find out. So uh, those are the things, and curiosity, I would say, like that's obviously an, in an a, a integral part of being an investigative journalist. So yeah, it's provided one has those sort of personality characteristics of intense curiosity, tenacity, a bit of stubbornness, a bit of obsessiveness, and maybe attention to detail, what then? You know, that doesn't just make you an investigative journalist. So if I could put this slide on the screen. Um, yeah, so, so this is like a breakdown, a very sort of quick breakdown of, of the curriculum for investigative, the, just the investigative reporting module at City, And it's broken down like this. Um, so the main things that I'm trying to teach across, uh, and we only have about nine months basically, we take people who've had no journalistic experience to a level of professionalism that they could go work in any top level newsroom. Um, and be a decent researcher. They can write print news, and they can do uh, basic, they can, they can make a documentary, a small documentary film. 
because we teach across all media because that's where the investigative jobs are. So they have to, it's quite an intense program because we're teaching how to write news stories, how to uh, film, and how to do intense research methodology. So the first thing we have to start off with, um, well, so I'll, I'll go through this module briefly. So that we're trying to teach sort of, I would say, three main things in this module. One is there's a lot of focus on research methods. Um, so the, some of the assignments you'll see at the, at the bottom there, these are the assignments that students do. Um, one of them is that, and the students really like this, this is a background profile where you pick a target person and you use every kind of open source intelligence that you can to find out about that person and you build a dossier on them. Um, you're not doing anything illegal, you're just using whatever is available um, online. Um, the person can, can't know that you're looking into them. But this is like a real staple of investigative journalism and it gets the students like thinking into like, well, what's available on that person and how do I use the internet intelligently? How can I sort of peel back, uh, you know, layers to find out photographs that the person, you know, might have put on Flickr or Facebook that they sort of didn't set the privacy settings correctly to. Um, and you gather all that together and then it's also teaching them about uh, so one, one of the things I noticed is when they did this background profile, it's about the quality of your sourcing. So if you're finding, for example, family connections of somebody, what is the, what is the source that you use? And some students might just use uh, a random blog site they've, they've found on the internet to, to say like, well, this is their family tree. And you say, but that's not, why would you trust that, that website? It's just run by some random guy. Uh, one, one, of this, one of these was a random guy in Australia whose like his hobby was um, family trees. And so he, was, he just put together this, this website. And I said, well, if you're in a newsroom, you've got no idea that that's a, a legitimate site. And you could easily be hoaxed or you know, you'll put in, in wrong information into the public domain if that's your source. So just that exercise gets them used to doing quite a lot of um, digging around, um, verification, and thinking about the quality of, of source material that you use. They also do a company report. So that's, that's to kind of get people thinking about following the money and how money works and how it travels, uh, which, is a, which is a crucial element for investigative journalism. And then a big, the big thing is um, this group investigative project that they do, and they do it in both print and they make a seven minute documentary film. So there's 24 students on the course and they all pitch ideas um, in January of what they want to investigate. And then I, I bring in a panel of industry professionals um, so the head of Channel 4 News Investigations, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, other um, documentary filmmakers and some print investigative editors. And the students all have to give, the, the give their one page proposal to these editors and then they get grilled each for 10 minutes uh, by them. And it's a very, <laughs> it's a very nerve wracking experience for them. But it really gets them, uh, they really start to understand how uh, ideas hit reality and how an editor is gonna start to, you know, push back against your proposals. And so of those 24, only six were greenlit, went through the, that, that sort of process. And then the editors had two more ideas that they put into the mix. And so then the students spent the rest of that term working in groups of three on these eight investigations. And um, so that's, uh, that's sort of the culmination of that module. And then they go on in, in term three to do an individual project um, that's, that's even in more depth. It's a, it's a 5,000 word investigation. So um, I think I'd just say one more thing. Um, that's investigative, but even before we get into the investigative, there's an element that if you're coming from nothing, how do you uh, even get to the point where you can start doing investigations? And um, I thought I'd show you one of my students' um, journalism portfolio. So this is our basic reporting class. 
but they do it through a lens of, an, of investigation. And so every uh, student gets assigned a, a small patch of London. And, and this is how all the journalism paths are taught at City and, and also at Columbia. But you get this, it's like a kind of local journalism apprenticeship where you, you're, either, you're covering the local councils, you're doing all that stuff. Um, but, um, and every week you have to file a story. So, so this is um, one of my students' uh, portfolio. And I just thought I'd show you a few examples. Um, and and we, we go, this is when we're grading, we go through and we're like this sort of detailed about uh, all the comments. But I thought I'd show you this one because this is just an off diary story, which is what in Britain is kind of a, it's not an event, it's, it's a sort of uh, an, a, an, a story that's generated by the reporter's own curiosity. So this was um, uh, sort of, this is what I mean by it's, it's a local story, but done with a bit of an investigative lens. So this is like a kind of basic story about a restaurant inspection. <laughs> um, and so he's pulled the restaurant inspections for all of the restaurants in this neighborhood to see which ones have failing inspection reports. And then he went to this restaurant and wrote uh, a story about that it was like infested with mice and it's still open. Um, and then he's trying to get to the bottom of like, how, how is it that it's still open? Like, why isn't the council taking any, any action? And, and also he's trying to trace the ownership of this company to find out, well, who actually owns it? And, and he can't, through our company's registration in the UK, it's not really clear who owns it. But what he, what he was able to do is he bought a coffee at this, at this restaurant and it had the VAT number, which is the official <coughs> taxation number. And that gives the official, the official um, registration of the company. And so from that, he's able to then pull the records and write, write up this story. So um, that's kind of my last example where I just thought I'd show you in the real world, how how uh, yeah, students kind of can can do do these sorts of things and learn. Um, so I'm going to pass over now to Anya, who's going to talk a bit about Columbia and what what they do there to teach it. Can everyone hear me? Not good. You can get rid of this screen now. Not yet. Okay. Good. Thank you. I'll quickly go over three things. I'll talk a little bit about Colombia. I'll talk about some of the work I've done in Africa, and I'll talk about some of the work I've done on curriculum. Um, at SEPA, we believe a lot in context and policy, so our students take a lot of sort of economics and statistics classes and policy classes, and when they go into journalism, if they go into journalism, that helps them a lot. At the journalism school, where I don't teach, we've had a huge resurgence of emphasis on investigative journalism. Our dean, Steve Cole, was at the Washington Post and has published many investigative books. And he promoted Sheila Coronel from the Philippines to run the Stabil Investigative Reporting Center. So they've now started using huge data sets and they've hired a private detective to work with students. And they created a fellowship for students who graduated to stay working on big projects. So they did a big expose of Exxon and their um, hiding information on climate change. They worked with a reporter at the New York Times and some of the students to do a bunch of exposés that followed up on the Panama Papers and the Panama Canal. And then they've also done a lot of exposing of Trump's money laundering in, um, in Eastern Central Europe, and I think actually some of the stands. And what's been so interesting about these collaborations is that the students have been able to learn while doing, while working on real stories with expert journalists, and then publishing those stories um, in places like the New York Times, the New Yorker, ProPublica. And I th what I've seen around the world is that many of the more successful reporting outlets have this combination of university and mainstream media outlet, which can really help train the journalists and then also get the stories out afterwards. I think also that was one of the main things about the Panama Papers and the work that ICIJ has done is that in many parts of the world, in, in Africa and in other places, they have been able to work with young journalists and, and, and work with them on big stories. And that's really helped train them. 
I spent um, years designing curriculum and helping train journalists in Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan and also in southern Africa on how to write about oil and gas and mining. Also things like trade agreements and economic subjects. And I would always bring an expert with me to help train the journalists. But what I found is all that time in the classroom helped. But what really helped was when they got to work on real stories with real publications. So I think that's a very nice add-on. You know, we can train the students at school, but then they have to get out and get real practice, which it sounds like Heather's doing. And I think the final thing I wanted to talk about is that um, I teach a lot on the context and the importance of investigative journalism. And one of the things I saw early on was that everybody refers back to Watergate or some of the, you know, the thalidomide stories at the Sunday Times, or the muckrakers who were great American investigative journalists in the 20th century. So I actually did two books on investigative journalism in the global south. So in global muckraking, we went back 200 years, and we found how did journalists in South America and Asia and Africa cover the stories we cover today, things like trafficking of women or corruption or police brutality. And both of these books were the first time anybody had bothered to do that, to bring together dozens of pieces from the global south in one place with context. So these are actually being used in a lot of books, um, a lot of classes now. And I think that's really useful if you're studying investigative journalism to understand that a lot of the stories have been done over and over again and to understand you know, why sometimes they have an impact and people pay attention to those stories and sometimes they don't. I actually brought extra copies in case anyone's teaching and wants to use them. I'll be happy to give them to you after class. But that was, um, teaching materials is actually really important when you're thinking about investigative journalism because you need something as well as the sort of world out at large. Thank you. Great. That's it for now. Um, so moving on to James. So you were a student of mine, in fact, I was. <laughs> and um, so maybe, yeah, maybe you can speak to what it was like to be a student, what worked, what didn't work, and I guess what you felt transitioning into the into the workplace. It's, um, I mean, I, I actually I was the first student enrolled on the city's investigative program, um, and now I teach on it. So it's quite a, a strange set of perspectives, but I've taught on it most years since I did it. And sort of from my own experience and from a lot of ex-students who I'm in touch with, one of the interesting things for me is that it's not the classes that are coolest or that get the best reception from students at the time that they come to value sort of later in the workplace. I think, look, we need to be pretty honest with ourselves and we often, especially when we talk about teaching journalism, we ignore what actual newsrooms are like and certainly early career journalism now, even journalism teaching, you are expected to come in at, say, 22, 23 years old, uh, able to picture edit, aware of social media, able to write, able to sort of filter all of that stuff through, to know how online production works, to do your own online production, um, to often do video, to do interactive, to, to be able to make interactives. You can end up teaching so much just on the production side that you never at any stage teach anyone how to find a story. And it turns out newsrooms don't really need that. There are at least two newsrooms in the UK of major nationals that have a rate of either one story every 45 minutes or one story every hour. Now that's not to write it, that's to write it, add, add pictures, add all the captions, get it in the CMS and get it live. Um, one journalist, I think, estimated they have about 11 minutes to do the actual writing on a story, including the reporting. Now, if that's the job market we're putting people into, obviously we don't want to be putting them in those jobs, but a lot of early jobs don't give you much scope and don't give you much training. You don't get the old cut your teeth, get sent out to report stuff that you're used to. And so what I think the course has done very well in a lot of ways is help equip people for when their opportunity to do some real reporting comes up. Either they manage to create it, they do it in their spare time because they've got hustle, uh, which tends to be a core skill, um, or you know, just something eventually comes up, a senior reporter's off. Um, and so the City course actually tries to 
and how, you know, Heather's kept this on, it has ever since I was there, keep very connected to real journalists and real newsrooms. So there are classes on things like how to circumvent an editor who obviously wants to kill your story, uh, how, to, how to deal with lawyers, both yours and theirs. Um, I've worked with some absolutely wonderful lawyers um, and I've tangled with some absolute monsters on the other side. Um, but we teach sort of a lot of those things and you tend to see quite disillusioned faces in that class. But that's the one sort of time after time that you find ex-students who are doing good work um, who come and go, you know what, that one was really helpful because it happened. Um, and so what I think you sort of want as a student and what you expect as a student is some magic trick on how you do an investigation. It's like, aha, that's the secret question where they suddenly open up and tell you. And there sort of isn't really an aha moment. You can give people lots of better research skills than they otherwise would have. Um, and so I would also kind of say as a close to my initial remarks, not a, the majority of the graduates of the investigative journalism program do not have the job title investigative journalist because how many people have that job title um, other than Alice? Um, but it doesn't mean that they're not using the skills, that you're not in other areas of the newsroom getting reporters who know how to check information, that dig up enterprise stories, that can handle a scoop, that don't sort of spook at pushback. And, you know, whether they're doing that from sort of the business desk or whether they're doing that on very particular patches, which a lot of them are, I think you turn out journalists with a much better skill set and hopefully with a more sceptical attitude. Because, um, you know, I think the, the bit of investigative journalism you really can't teach is it really sucks if you like being liked. <laughs> like, that, that's, the, that's the definite unteachable set. So what I would say is you can give people a skill set and a mindset and also just essentially a sort of rough memory at the back of their head, where if something goes wrong, and you know, I was taught at City, getting the story is half of it. Getting it published is the other half, and the first half is completely pointless if you don't manage the second, um, which I thought was horribly cynical at the time. But then what's the point in raking up people's lives and finding something out if you don't tell the world about it? And so, like, getting that kind of real-world wisdom and getting the benefits of sort of that as a young student, I think, for me, was incredibly valuable. Great, thank you. So, Alice, yes, you, you have the revered title of investigative journalist. <laughs> how, did you, how did you get that? How did, what was your sort of path well, from actually out? <laughs> I actually don't use the title investigative journalist. I don't, I don't like it very much because I feel that the distinction between investigative reporter and reporter is a somewhat artificial one. Um, you know, basically the only real commodity that we have that normal reporters don't have is the luxury of time. And... I feel like it creates sort of quite an unhealthy distinction. Also, I don't use it in my job title because it really freaks people out when you email <laughs> them. <laughs> you sound like you're coming from the department of, I'm here to mess your life up. Um, so I did the course in my late 20s in 2010, 2011, and it sounds as though it's sort of moved on a little from, oh my goodness. <laughs> um, uh, it was... Um, it was certainly enjoyable and really interesting, and I went on from there to work at the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, The Guardian, and I now work at Unearthed, which is Greenpeace UK's investigative um, unit. And, yeah, so the course gives you all of the sort of techniques that Heather describes, and also a grounding in law and in shorthand and in all these sort of techniques that you use every day. And what it really gave you, I felt, was like contacts and confidence, and more than anything else, I think, and this is the uncomfortable bit for me, is that it gave you a brand on your CV that opened doors in the industry that wouldn't normally be open. However, the real skills of investigative journalism, I felt you learnt in the newsroom, actually. You learnt them from working alongside like proper operators, like Chris Woods at the Bureau or Ian Cobain at The Guardian, people who'd been doing the sort of shoe-leather reporting for decades and who'd never been anywhere near a sort of fancy-pants course. And... This is one of my real concerns about, about investigative journalism as it's currently taught, is that it's really, really expensive. When I did the course, it cost £9,000, plus the cost of living in London for a year. Now this, I managed to fund it through the combination of a bursary, a loan from my parents, freelancing, 
all of those sort of, it was a real hodgepodge and it took years to pay, to pay for it back because starting salaries in investigative journalism <laughs> are pathetic. Um, so I really worry that when you teach um, a course that's that expensive, you sort of limit access to investigative journalism and you, and you create a sort of impression that you're professionalizing a part of an industry which actually, as you say, the, the real key competencies can't really be taught. Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, what we, what we do is basically we're replicating what the, the education that used to happen in newsrooms. And so it used to be that uh, people would, would come from you know, anywhere and they would, they would work for years in a local paper, gain their experience, and then they would sort of move up the ranks. And then within a, within a national newsroom, there would be a lot of old timers with, with you know, huge amounts of experience. Um, and then they would sort of be the mentors of the younger reporters coming up. But what we found in the industry is that like the newsrooms don't want to, they can't afford people like me, <laughs> unfortunately. Like once you get to a certain level, uh, that's when the newsrooms start to shave off those people from, you know, the, exactly the people who could teach their, you know, younger staff the most are the, are the biggest drain on the payroll. And so they get cut loose. And, then, and, and they increasingly go into universities, funnily enough. Um, and, and then the local um, journalism where a lot of young people would start out are closing or closed. And so that, uh, that method of training, you know, getting training has gone. And so, yeah, I don't think it's the ideal, like I do think the old way was, was, a, was, a, was a good way, but unfortunately it just doesn't exist anymore. So that's kind of what we have to create in the classroom. And that's why we kind of do that, that patch reporting is because, and, and Columbia does it too, where we're basically kind of taking the two years, two to three years that a, that a young reporter would work at a local newspaper and condensing it into three months as a sort of, you know, fast track apprenticeship. And um, yeah, that's, um, I don't know what people think about that, but... <laughs> I mean, it's, it's terribly unfair that the burden of training goes from the employer to the employee, but, um, you, know, you know, Alice is absolutely spot on to raise access problems. I know Heather and I'm sure lots of others work to try and make sure there are bursaries available, there are sort of other issues, but I think we would be completely dishonest if we didn't say the cost of getting an MA isn't another barrier to increasing newsroom diversity and sort of increasing sort of plurality in the media. But um, unfortunately, there are so many people wanting to get into journalism, getting in the MA gives you an edge. Uh, it's very, very difficult to come up without it, without a lot of deliberate effort from newsrooms who have the resources, uh, who don't seem willing to show it beyond a sort of token effort or two. Um, so yeah, it's sort of, best of a bad world and having similarly absolutely struggled to get the money to pay it and paying it back after good god um you know it was genuinely i i could tell you the exact cost of every uh, smart price uh, thing in asda because super noodles were too expensive you had to get the off-brand ones like it it was i would know my bank balance to within about 5p at all moments uh, for about three years after city um, you know, it was pretty brutal. And it's hard to avoid the sensation that effectively we bought access to the industry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, so I'm, I want to ask you about jobs. Because um, I, I obviously think a lot about uh, getting these. I, I, want, I want investigative journalism to continue. I want the craft to, you know, keep going. And I want the students that we teach to get jobs. And we, we do have, like, most... Uh, most of our students do do some kind of investigative work after they graduate, and we have a very good employment rate of like nearly 100 percent. So, um, like our students will, the ones that from like the last couple of years, um, I know them. They've gone to work as researchers for documentary companies because that's a big market in Britain. A lot of uh, documentary films um, are still being made for the channels. Um, a few go into the nationals. Um, quite a few work in trade magazines. That's a big route after the class. Quite a couple go into the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. Um, a few go into like Sky News, um, not as uh, 
one went into like a special projects, um, making a documentary about plastic pollution, but then others will go on to the news desk. And, and I heard from one of the, one of the producers there that they, they like the people from the investigative class because they're more, unlike the broadcasters who are very focused on the technology, the investigatives they like because they generate ideas. They're, they're good at finding stories. Um, so those are kind of the main places I've seen people get jobs, but what about you, Anya? Um, well, what I was going to add is that in many countries of the world where I teach and work, there really isn't a way to practice investigative journalism. So we have a lot of Chinese students at Columbia, but China's really closed down on nearly all of its investigative reporting. Many of the African countries uh, where I've worked, there's maybe two or three people in the whole country that are doing what I call the global muckraking. And the other problem I'm seeing all over the place is that there's so much investigative reporting that's being produced, but there isn't that much audience appetite for it. So we have this huge shortage of investigative local reporting in the US, but in you know somewhere like Zambia or South Africa or Uganda, you know journalists will put themselves at great risk to do investigative journalism and then find when they get it out on the website that not actually that many people are looking at it. So I think in some parts of the world, we don't really have a supply side problem as much as a demand side problem. And, and that obviously fits with a lot of what you're saying about the, uh, the, the financing. You know, so you have sort of donors who are financing this stuff. It's getting out there and then it's not having much audience. Or people like the Daily Maverick in South Africa having a huge impact, you know, very involved, uh, really exposed a lot of the Gupta stories, but still couldn't figure out how to make any money afterwards. And um, you've alluded to the expense. James Hamilton's book, Democracy Detectives, talks about how the average investigative project at a U.S. small newspaper is like $350,000. And it provides vast benefits for society, but it's actually very expensive to finance. What about among your colleagues? Where are they now? Um, so the class of 2010, 2011, uh, one of them's over there. <laughs> he works at the New Statesman. Hi, Jasper. Um, so um, where are other colleagues? Tom Bodel is at Sky News. Um, Sam Francis is at um, Sam Francis is at BBC News. David Pegg is at the Guardian on their investigative team. Seb Payne is at the FT. He's just joined their Whitehall team. Um, you know, people have gone on to do some really, really interesting things. Not everybody stayed in journalism. Um, you know, it's definitely a, a path into the industry. Um, what about in the US, we're seeing a lot of the foundation funded nonprofits are hiring our students, the sort of the pro publicas, the Marshall projects, um, and that would certainly be true in the developing world. Is that also a, the case in England? Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, Alice is a good example of that because yeah. you're at Greenpeace now. But yeah, definitely Amnesty, Global Witness. Yeah, Bureau of Investigation. I mean, Bureau, the, the Bureau has been a massive hire of the city investigation because yeah. we both worked yeah. there. Um, not at the same time. It was, yeah, there was basically a sort of a feeder program for a while, wasn't there? Straight from, yeah. straight from the, uh, straight from Stanford. Yeah, and um, one thing um, that I find really rewarding about teaching is that we do get, we do get some foreign students and like I have a student from South Korea who's on the course right now and, um, and you know, we get students from South America and Africa and Ukraine, I have a student from the Ukraine this year and you can see that they have a, such a hunger to do investigations in their country, and their countries really need more investigative journalism, but there isn't really a program to learn it in, in those countries, and they're not learning it in the newsroom. And so they come, and you know, you really sort of, I, I feel quite optimistic that they come, they get all these skills, and then they go back to their you know, their hometown, and they, you know, what, what are they going to do with that? Like, the woman from South Korea is very keen to set up, you know, a center of uh, sort of investigative journalism expertise and sort of be the, the starting point for that. Um, I had a woman from Spain, and she was very involved in, like, FOI, and then she went back to Spain and was really active in the Spanish uh, Freedom of Information Act and using it and getting journalists trained in it. So it is a great way to sort of disseminate, you know, this sort of philosophy of investigative journalism. And, I mean, obviously, teaching investigative journalism isn't obviously limited to sort of three-year or two-year or one-year MA courses, there was really great work done by, for example, Finance Uncovered, where they do a sort of week-long summer school 
and teach journalists from the global south, um, all sorts of financial reporting things. So, yeah. you know, while I'm sounding very down on teaching of... Yeah. Um, I mean, the thing is, though, it is, it is a craft, and so it's not, it's not a theoretical learning thing. It's, it's a learning by doing. So, you know, if you really wanted to do it, you know, like, like myself, I didn't do a degree in invest... Most journalists of my generation, we never did a degree in investigative journalism. We just learned by doing. And so if you are that driven to do it, you know, don't think you have to get a degree. You certainly don't. Um, the degree gives you, like, skills and it gives you connections, but really, you can just learn by starting to do it. Well, there's also lots of bits that you are taught as part of the sort of city MA uh, <coughs> are sort of eminently practical skills. Um, you know, you get a sort of uh, about a 90-minute class in uh, advanced Googling, which you can always see that sort of students look early on, like the first two minutes, it's, I know how to use Google. And then the, the guy who teaches it sort of just sort of shows them, oh, no, no, they don't. <laughs> and, like, it breaks. Through. But that's a 90-minute class that comes out as a standalone. You know, very similar stuff comes in in data journalism. When you're teaching that for investigation, um, you're not really teaching data visualization or all the pretty graph stuff that people think of. It's how to sort of work with it for research because a horrible amount of stories end up sort of needing this. And, you know, I think Alice was working on the story just a couple of weeks ago that needed a database join, which she would have learned at City if she hadn't been slacking that class. Um, <laughs> I like well, you've got that little dig in. Um, but, um, but all of those ones can actually be taught sort of lifelong through career development and you do see good newsrooms send people to those you know there's far more run in the US but they are run in Europe and in the UK as well. I also think one of the best um, learning tools that I've found is simply just looking at what other people have done and reverse engineering other people's investigations and coming to events like this where people talk through what they did and how they did that you know you, those are some of the best learning experiences yeah. for me. So, questions. Who would like to ask a question? Yes, chap over there. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the need to have a brand to enter. A personal brand or? A personal brand, yeah, to enter investigative journalism. Can I just see a, a show of hands? How many people would like to ask a question? Okay. Oh, quite a few. Okay. I might just take a couple then. Uh, can I just take the lady next to you? So that was about brands, yeah. Yeah, um, um, I'm Carolina Guerrero, I work with Radio Ambulante, a Latin American project, and the question is, um, while I understand that, that people might not be able to go to school in Latin America, there are many challenges, are real challenges, like for example, covering Honduras or El Salvador. And those journalists there, they are really, like, they lack the, tool, the tools to learn. It's not just as easy as, like, um, dissecting an investigation that somebody did or published in London is, is more about how, like, like, you know, like learning by doing, but they, uh, they also need to pay, like, so many, I mean, they have three jobs in, in order to make it, no? That's the real world, like, life of journalists around the world. So my question is, how can they learn better, like, have better tools to, to do investigative reporting that is so needed to, uh, in their language, or if you can point out any any resources that we, I can share with that community of journalists. Thanks. Did you want to answer that, Anya? Did you say? Yeah, I mean, in around the world, there are so many networks that do journalism training and investigative training. And of course, in Latin America, the most famous one is the Gabriel Garcia Marquez Center in um, Cartagena de las Indias in Colombia, the FNPI, Fundación por Periodismo Iberoamericano. And um, I, so that would be one place to get training. I'm sure you know it. IJNet has, the website has lists of training opportunities all around the world. So lots and lots of groups like um, the Reuters Foundation, Central European University offer courses which are free for journalists in the global south. So there's quite a bit of training, Deutsche Welle Academy as well. But if you look on the IJNet website, you'll find many, many courses available for journalists from the global south. You're, you're a bit of a brand, aren't you, James? Why don't you speak about branding? Um, I mean, part of me always sort of wishes we could go to the era where anonymity and just, you know, you sit behind your publications brand 
um, and that works out fine for you. But I just don't think that era is coming back. Um, I don't think we really teach this stuff particularly uh, at City on any of the courses. Um, and I've kind of started to suspect we should because we have a horrible habit of forgetting that journalism is a business. And it's a business now that doesn't give you jobs for life. You don't get to enter a newsroom and sort of get banged out 45 years later as you retire. Um, and so if you've got to move around, if you're going to have to pitch, if you're going to have to work out how to make a living, part of that is sort of knowing how to build a rep, be someone that re gets reached out to be commissioned, etc. cetera. Um, and so I think trying to think about public profile is unfortunately part of the gig. Um, I think if I were better at it, I would look less shouty and mad on my Twitter feed. Um, but um, I do think sort of stuff like, I mean, the upside of journalists having a lot of production skills and this kind of stuff is there's a more and more sort of intrinsic understanding that you should have your own portfolio even while you're in a staff job. You should have cuts clippings around. You should have this stuff there. It all helps. All right, let's ask. Could I add to that? Oh, yes. Sure. I, I remember, you know, when I was like 20 and wanted to get into journalism, my father sitting down and teaching me how to write a pitch letter. And my first articles ever were in Time Out and, and City Limits. And I find with so many of my students, ex especially low-income students, di you know, diverse students, they really have absolutely no idea how to pitch themselves, how to network. I try to stress the importance of getting clips while you're still at university so when you graduate you have something to show people. But I, act, I think that's actually a really good idea, a course on how to develop a ramp. The point is, first of all, you have to have something to show. But once you've got something to show, figuring out how to tweet it and, and pitch it and get attention, I think it's a really great we, idea. We do actually explicitly teach how to pitch a story um, on the investigative course. And we also show real pictures that me and Heather have sent. Uh, I think on, I usually that, only I successful ones. We should show uh, <laughs> failures. Too. I show both, but it's <laughs> true. It's hard. It's a hard thing to write a pitch. It I is, mean, yeah. harder th almost than doing the story. Yeah. So the, there's the lady in the mustard. Sweater. Thank you. Um, I really like you emphasize about um, the investigation, the investigative uh, report in the Global South. Uh, and I think it's really fascinating when you mentioned about the challenges and uh, all different uh, opportunities. And I guess, although those reports mainly focus on, of course, domestic issues. Sometimes it's also kind of related to different nations, which make them actually can be seen by, you know, like a bigger international arenas. So my question is, uh, um, how can we best connect the journalists from global south uh, to the global north? Or how can we, for example, create these channels uh, for investigative journalists journalist from Global South to be seen on the publications in the global, global North. Because I believe, actually, they could really bring the value. However, it looks like we don't have too much of these opportunities. Thank you. Do you want to answer that, sure. Anya? You know, when I started doing all this kind of training 15, 20 years ago, this was a huge problem. And in many closed societies, the best I could say, I worked in Vietnam, for example, was, you know, to the local journalist, get the information, give it to your give it to Reuters, and then they'll tell their person in London, and we'll be able to join up the dots between you know, what's happening, say, in London at the shareholders meeting, and you know, the mining disaster in your town. So there was always a lot of like sort of stealth sharing, but I'm really happy that now there's a lot of networks that do that deliberately. So ZAM in Amsterdam commissioned stories from African journalists working with Dutch journalists on the premise that they will be published. So there's a lot of NGOs that are doing that now. I also know a group in Washington that is taking academics and intellectuals from the Global South and giving them media training, teaching them how to write op-eds so that they can be voice, their voice can be heard in the North. And then again, all the things like organized crime and corruption reporting projects, ICIJ, there's now a lot of networks that are joining journalists together. Ha you know, happy to give you more information, but there's so many things that have really changed in the last 15, 20 years when I yeah. started doing this kind of work. Great. Thank you. Okay, other questions? I think this 
that one. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, hi. Um, I'm a more mature student studying data journalism with Paul Bradshaw at the back of the room. Oh, right. um, Paul Bradshaw, where are you? <laughs> you are, <thank> you. <laughs> um, and I've come from a, another career of other and other careers, but as a librarian, do you think there are other careers people can transition from well into investigative journalism? What, what's a good mm -hmm. skill set to have if you're more mature? Alice or James, do you want to answer that? Um, I've seen a few work out quite well. You tend to, um, I've heard from others who teach that law enforcement goes one of two ways. Um, people uh, can either be absolutely brilliant because they've got the right kind of sort of sleuthing mind or they completely fall down when they can't compel people to talk to them, mm -hmm. uh, which is quite an interesting one. Um, my guess is a librarian would fit really well. Like just, it, it just seems a kind of perfect transition. Um, I do also know quite a few investigative journalists who are ex-lawyers. Um, I mean, the two professions are roughly as popular at parties. So, um, But I, I think those are the th sort of three for me with an obvious connection. I don't know if others have, uh, have more. Did, sorry, did you we mean, did, builder, did you mean like what <laughs> the professions that they come from into investigative journalism or you, you were an investigative journalist and then you did some, do something else? No, the, uh, the, fir the first. Okay. Um, I was a sub-editor before I was a... Uh, I was I was a sub editor before I was an investigative journalist, and I feel like that gave me quite a good grounding because you're always checking that the figures add up, that um, you know you're checking your details line by line, and I feel like that served me well, particularly at the beginning. I would say also things like accounting and industry professionals, anyone who's worked in finance, Dow Jones or Bloomberg, will sort of snap them up straight away. Yeah, I mean. Some of the interesting, I get a lot of philosophy candidates, um, funnily enough, um, and I wonder if that's sort of like a, a ver an interest in truth and sort of how society organizes itself, lives, values, so that's, that's something. But I agree, like if I see certain types of people, I snap them up. Like I just had, I've had somebody from um, a financial services regulator who was an investigator. I've had fraud investigators. Obviously, those people I'm very keen on. But equally, I'm very keen on um, people from unusual backgrounds. Like I had a biochemistry um, undergraduate, and uh, I, I really wanted to hire him. And he got he got instantly snapped up by the bureau because they really wanted somebody who could. Um, had all the skills of an investigative journalist, but understood how to read cl clinical trial data which he did from his scientific background. So I think, you know, if you, if you also can bring another skill to the table, that's really useful. Yes, Paul Bradshaw. There you go. Hello. Um, yeah, I'm going to disagree with you about the fact that you can't teach um, tenacity and curiosity. It, I guess my question is, to, to what extent do you think um, that potentially excludes people who haven't been raised in, in quite pushy backgrounds. So, Anya, you talked about your, your father showing you how to write a pitch. And, and I'm very conscious my very middle class children have a very different, you know, they get all those skills, but, but my background I didn't. And I, I'm, I'm curious how, how that factors in and how you can teach those skills. Um, I want to answer that. <laughs> you go first, go I'll, I'll be quick. Um, I, but I think you cannot instill them if they're not there to begin with. I think you can foster them if they're not obvious. Uh, and believe it or not, I was very shy once um, and really hated sort of putting up for anything and sort of through City and a few things before it, it can be encouraged. I think there are people who can seem sort of very on it and who are bright, who are there, but they don't actually have the curiosity, etc. I think the underlying quality is there and can be fostered or not, and it's not always the obvious candidates. Oh, good. Um, I follow my students throughout their careers because often they come back when they need help job hunting. Um, and so I think the, the good thing is watching how they grow. I've had so many students who graduate, and I thought, you know, He's an okay writer, but once they get that first job and once they get that discipline and having to file stories all the time, they really become superstars. Conversely, I've seen incredible students not find work and really start to get very, very demoralized. So I do think people can learn, people can improve, um, but I think that you know, youth employment is 
incredibly important in that process, actually. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I also, I used to be a little bit judgmental when I first started teaching and I would sort of spot like, you're gonna be a star, you're, you know, and, and what I realized is like, I can't, I can't actually spot the, spot the stars um, because the, the, the sort of unfurling of each student across the year is, 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 is very individual to that person. And some people might come in and you think they're amazing, but they just, they're not, they don't actually progress at the same rate. And then other people you think, oh, they're a bit lame, like they never ask any questions and they're just not putting the effort in. And then they'll just suddenly have some light bulb moment and their whole, you know, sort of mindset transforms. So in that front, I sort of, yeah, I'm a bit less, I guess, arrogant in the sense like I can sort of predict who's gonna be great and who's not, that, um, there are these kind of latent, I guess, character traits, and a lot of society, a lot of what we're trying to sort of teach, I guess, is um, to to sort of transcend a lot of social norms. So you know, if if you respect authority, which you know that is a kind of thing that we learn from, you know, we're conditioned. But if you're an investigative journalist, you know, the whole kind of thing of what you're doing is to is to challenge authority, you know, and. And I know there's a David Pegg I'm thinking of. We're very similar in the sense that we're really frightened of getting into trouble, and yet we fe feel compelled to get into trouble. It's like this very odd paradox that um, you know we can feel all the sort of like, oh God, I'm doing something that's really going to piss people off. And I don't actually, well, I do and I don't like making people angry, especially powerful people. Like I sort of get kind of frightened about it, but also like secretly exhilarated about it <laughs> um, <laughs> and how could you teach that but you know it's kind of through the doing especially in these group projects I noticed that the students really started to to to, to um, find the story and then they start to you know because you're always looking for uh, a, I don't want to say a villain but you're investigating a problem and you're trying to find out who's responsible for that problem and at the end of the investigation you know you put the accusations to that person responsible and you can see they suddenly feel this great sense of kind of empowerment like yeah I'm making a difference like I'm doing something and uh, yeah they, they, they understand like um, if they might have been shy or maybe you thought oh they weren't very tenacious like suddenly they get it and then they do become quite you know after that they're like challenging people in power in a way you didn't think they were capable of before. Um, one last question, otherwise let's just um, have some final thoughts. Can you teach it, <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> but a bit yes, more. but it's only part of a lifelong learning process. <laughs> oh, very brief. <laughs> <laughs> um, aspects of it you can teach, aspects of it you have to just go out and learn the hard way, um, but access really does need to be improved. If and, but, but would you, I mean, I guess having gone through that course, did you think it was worth it? I felt, well, I mean, I, I went on to work as an investigative reporter on, you know, a number of projects that I'm really proud to have worked on, so I can't help but feel that it was worthwhile for me personally, but there does remain the abiding sense that I bought my way into the industry, and that's uncomfortable. Yeah. James? Um, I, I think very bluntly, there are some people who you could give absolute world-class teaching to who just who want or think they want to be an investigative reporter and never will there are some who will just through their own aptitudes and personality the teaching might help them slightly but it won't really make a difference one way or another they were going to do it i think there's probably a much bigger zone of people in between who if they take it and want to it can make the difference and it can craft them into it so you know, can can it be taught? Not entirely, but teaching helps. Yeah, um, yeah, and I'd ref I'd ref I'd agree with that. Um, I mean, I'm really pleased to be able to teach it because I feel like these are such great skills that need to be passed on to new generations. And I want I feel like this is you know the real epitome of public interest <coughs> journalism resides in investigative journalism and these skills. So I want them to be I want them to be passed on. And the main way we pass them on, unfortunately it's not so much through newsrooms, but it is increasingly through the universities. So uh, I'm glad that at least there is this kind of repository of, of the expertise in the field. Thanks very much everyone. Thanks. Sir.